brings us to the valedictory. And uh, hello. Yeah, I think that was a terrific day, uh, a long one, and uh, I think the longest concluding session. And this now brings us to the valedictory. And uh, I would request Mr. Sudhindra Kulkani and the Honorable Consul General of Japan, uh, Mr. Yoshiaki Ito, to please come on stage. And I would request the Honorable Consul General to please uh, give his concluding remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry, uh, uh, because of a very important uh, appointment in Kulaba, I couldn't cover the whole, uh, whole session, just uh, uh, one or two sessions I covered. But uh, uh, the last session is uh, quite inspiring, insp uh, quite, uh, what they say, uh, impressed for me. Uh, it came to my mind that uh, one uh, year uh, in 19th century, 1853, 1853. 1853 is a quite important uh, 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 epoch-making year for Japan because the uh, uh, first steam boat made by Arian came from the United States and visited Japan. For the first time, the people in the Japan had a chance to watch on the modern steam engine uh, a merchant ship we call the uh, black ship, uh, Kurofune. This is a kind of a game changer uh, or the starting of the modernization of Japan. But at the same time, 1853, the first commuting train were operated in Mumbai. So the train system started in Mumbai faster than in Japan. Then, because of the kind of the rhetoric of history, my country now is a pride for the train system and uh, asking a collaboration with India to support or the, our system introduction to the new, as a new uh, modernized uh, train system. However, you have a good experience, good memory about uh, modern train technology. I know that uh, outside of uh, so-called Western powers, only three Asia African countries can um, what they say, uh, assemble the very high-tech uh, train at the time called uh, locomotive trains. Uh, dissolving and maintain and uh, assemble again that such very complicated uh, train uh, uh, locomotive si uh, system uh, train. One is Japan, second is South Africa, then third was India. So you have a knowledge, know-how, how to make a high-tech train. So we have no hesitation to say that uh, sooner or later you become, what you say, implement uh, the entire new train, uh, train network system in entire India. Besides all that, uh, metro, metro issues, this is also the quite important system. Even though we can shorten the time between uh, Ahmedabad and Mumbai in two and a half hours, the connection to the urban development system, urban transportation system cannot be what is uh, constructed well. That is uh, still a waste of time. So hope the Mumbai, city of Mumbai and the state of Maharashtra think more seriously the introduction of the public uh, transportation state system, new transportation system. Anyway, uh, this is a good opportunity for us to exchange the views and uh, questions. And uh, I found several weak points of my country. So I'm very much satisfied with this debate. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Consul General. I entirely endorse and reiterate uh, <clears throat> what Consul General Ito said at the end, that this has been a highly satisfying conference. Satisfying because it was highly educative. I'm sure all of you will agree with me that uh, we go back with a lot of learnings, learnings about India-Japan partnership, learnings about Japan, and also learnings about our own country and to some extent our own city. We covered uh, wide-ranging issues in this one day, <clears throat> beginning with economic cooperation, peace and prosperity in Asia, Asia-Pacific, and very rightly pointed out by the speakers in the second session that it's not uh, you know, Ambassador Alok Prasadji, that not Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific. The third session, cultural, creative, artistic, and spiritual commons, and then we had infrastructure and smart cities. So I want to thank all the speakers, all the distinguished speakers. We would have liked to <clears throat> listen to them longer period, especially you know, when Admiral Chauhan was speaking, we felt deprived of the opportunity of uh, uh, you know, learning from his uh, very deep knowledge same with Ambassador Rangachari. He, he simply had to skip so many of his uh, well-researched slides. Nevertheless, <clears throat> each of the speakers has added to our understanding of uh, India-Japan partnership. And on behalf of the Observer Research Foundation, and on your behalf, friends, let's give them a big hand. One of the reasons we <clears throat> decided to partner with uh, the Japanese consulate here on organizing this conference is because the Observer Research Foundation in Mumbai is deeply committed to regaining, restoring Bombay's global outlook. You know, we must once again make this great city a truly global city with a global outlook with global networks, something that over the period, over, over the past several decades, has got weakened. Ambassador Aftab said, mentioned that uh, the Japanese consulate was established here 1896, even before it was established in the then capital of India, Calcutta. And I've heard, and I hope uh, I'm not making a mistake in this, but I heard that before the Second World War, the Japanese population in Mumbai was close to some 2,000. It has dwindled precipitously. We must make Mumbai a global city with uh, a very broad spectrum of global population, a city that is that is vibrant in terms of discussing global issues and making its own contribution to the big issues of the day as far as the world is concerned. And this is one of the reasons, friends, that ORF Mumbai has been, has been trying to partner with consulates in Mumbai, embassies in Delhi, and other international organizations in organizing events like these and we are very happy that this one has turned out to be extremely satisfying. Ambassador Set mentioned that he went to Japan more than 50 years ago. And while we were, you know, in the, 
in the course of the conference, he quietly sent uh, his book to me. It's half a century, my connections with Japan, a memoir. And he wrote something, friends, and I would, look, I would like to read out just one passage here. He wrote this in June 1963. And it's so valid. Friendship in Japan is like Japanese food. In the same way as it is difficult to determine the taste of a piece of ika in the beginning, it is difficult to ascertain the strength of a Japanese friendship in the beginning. But slowly, as one eats more sushi, one begins to appreciate its taste. A Japanese friendship too grows in value with the passage of time. It is this subtlety which I found very noticeable in Japan, in the food, the climate, and the friendships. There is none of the open, gushing kind of friendship that one finds in India. You know, Japanese are very unique people. There is none of the open, gushing kind of friendship that one finds in India. I'm not quite certain which form of friendship I prefer, but I certainly value my Japanese friends as one of the most precious things in my life. This is what Aftab said, he said, wrote in 1963. So friendship with Japan, it doesn't come quickly. Because friendships that come very quickly can also dissipate quickly. You know, as was mentioned in one of the earlier sessions, you know, the, the Japanese, are, they take their own time to make friendships. But once they make a decision, once they make a friendship, then it is almost unbreakable. They take a, you know, it is said by some of the people, oh, they are, there's too much delay in decision making, they are too consensus bound, but some of these qualities are also highly valuable. There is a great level of ethics in Japanese businesses and of course their concern for the environment and all that. So we have to first of all appreciate the uniqueness of Japan. And I I think that today's conference enabled us, helped us to understand so many things that are truly unique and so admirable. The fact that in becoming a prosperous nation, the third prosperous nation in terms of you know, dollar economy, it still has the third highest forest cover you know, as was pointed out by Ajit Ranade. Now, forests, great heritage of nature, they have preserved it. That is also wealth. Similarly, culture. You know, we, we spend so much ta time talking about smart cities, but uh, one of the ladies here asked a question about where is, what is the place for culture in this whole smart city, conceptualization and planning and development, very pertinent question. Culture. You know, lunchtime, Alok Prasadji, <clears throat> he said something about the culture of Japan, of which resilience, the collective spirit, is the core. 1945, the country was devastated. But 1964, in less than two decades, Japan organized, Japan hosted the Olympics. In less than 20 years, they had Shinkansen. They had rebuilt the airport, one of the most modern airports in the world. And as the Consul General pointed out, Railways was born in India much earlier, but today we are seeking Japanese cooperation in high-speed rail technology. But it's not just, it's not just uh, these physical aspects 
that constitute culture. You know, when this horrible tragedy struck Japan in 2011, the triple tragedy of earthquake, tsunami, and the nuclear meltdown, you know, we had organized, as I mentioned, we had organized the talk by the former Japanese ambassador, Mr. Saiki, and uh, we had put up one poster, friends, which of course we had uh, taken from the net. And it is there in the document that we have circulated to you. It says 10 things to learn from Japan. And this goes to the heart of the unique culture of Japan that we need to learn from. One, the calm. Not a single, when this tragedy happened, when this natural calamity happened, not a single visual of chest beating, wild grief, sorrow itself has been elevated. The second quality, the dignity, discipline cues for water and groceries. Not a, not a rough order, not a rough word or a crude gesture. The third quality, the ability, the incredible architecture. For instance, building swayed but did not fall. You know, Japan is a place that very frequently experiences earthquakes. So they have, they have found the, the technology, the architecture to take care of these things. The grace, people bought only what they needed for the present. So everybody could get something. Five, the order, no looting in shops, no honking and no overtaking the, on the roads, just understanding. Six, the sacrifice. 50 workers stayed back to pump seawater in the nuclear reactors. How will they ever be repaid? You know, it was mentioned that none other than the emperor and the empress, they visited the, the place within days of what happened. So it is the leadership that shows the way. Seven, the tenderness. Restaurants cut prices. Restaurants cut prices. An unguarded ATM is left alone. The strong cared for the weak. Eight, the training. The old and the children Everyone knew exactly what to do, and they did just that to take care of the old and the children. The media, they showed magnificent restraint in the bulletins. They showed magnificent restraint in the, in the bulletins, no silly reporting, only calm and restrained reporting. Lastly, the conscience. When the power went off in a store, People put things back on the shelves and left quietly. This is culture. It does not come with whether a country is rich or poor. Culture is formed over a period of hundreds of years, thousands of years. And in, in the course of the conference, I really felt that uh, our, our session on culture and spiritual traditions it really lent a very, it, it imparted a unique understanding to what Japan is. And that for that, we should really thank Jaya Jetliji. We should thank Abha. We should thank the monk from the Japanese temple in Worli. Someone who has been living here for decades. And I don't know how many of you have visited the temple. Every time I visit the temple, it's on one of the most busiest roads in, 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 in Bombay. Once you are inside the temple, all you experience is peace and tranquility. That goes to show spirit of a place, you know, a phrase that Abha used in her, uh, in her presentation. Spirit of a place. And that spirit of a place really extends to the whole nation of Japan.
there is something about the spirit of the Japanese people which in spite of all adversities they have retained and that is what we need to learn so what Alok Prasad ji said to, you know, at the end of his speech the strongest ace that Japan has is people and therefore the strongest ace that even India has is our people we must revive our culture our spiritual traditions our artistic traditions this is our intangible wealth far more precious than the physical wealth that we are creating the physical wealth of course is is important but it is far more precious that we have inherited from the past our culture our spiritualism our artistic traditions so we have I would say a certain holistic understanding of India Japan partnership in the course of this conference I would like to say one more thing friends in in the session on uh, peace and security there was some discussion on uh, India Japan and of course China and China has to figure because China has become important in Asia and in the world and China is our neighbor we cannot wish away China we at the observer research foundation you know we have been making our own small efforts to promote better understanding between India and China and we believe that India Japan China we have to work together there are issues between China and Japan and we fervently wish that these issues are resolved peacefully because there is there is a the, the, the uh, once again the cultural and spiritual and civilizational ties linguistic ties between Japan and China they are far more important than the present disputes and I'm we really hope that the wisdom of Chinese people and the wisdom of the Japanese people will help them overcome the problems that that have cropped up in recent times and India the land of Buddha Buddha's philosophy that traveled from India to China and from China to Japan we have to remain true to the principles and the philosophy of Buddha we have to remain true to our commitment to world peace to peace in Asia and not commit the mistakes that the West committed so I felt that I should I should reiterate this point in the in the concluding session I'm very happy friends that uh, we have partnered with the with the consulate and this partnership we would very much like to continue and get strengthened I want to thank the audience even though the conference is extended well well beyond uh, uh, the stipulated time you all have been here listening patiently participating very passionately so we want to thank you. Without you, this conference wouldn't have been a success. Thank you very much. Dhanyawad. Yeah, just a small announcement that in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, we'll have the dinner served right outside. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all of our speakers, uh, you have really made this day special for us and so with your permission we can bring this conference to a close. Thank you very much. <laughs>